I definitely need to hit the record button before we get started. That that would be a good thing. Uh, it's recording on my end. I don't know. There you go. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my immense pleasure to welcome to the show a man that has been kind enough to allow me to darken the doorstep of his own show on TNT Radio twice now. The great and powerful Hervoye Morich, host of the Hervoye Morich Show on TNT Radio, as well as the phenomenal podcast, Geopolitics and Empire. Hervoye, welcome to Liberty Radio. Happy Monday. It's great to be here. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, happy Monday, which uh, in, in uh, Liberty Radio land uh, seems to be when, when everything goes wrong. I'm actually, I'm thinking I might need to just start broadcasting seven days a week in order to prevent chaos uh, from coming around the studio. No, it definitely, when you say everything goes wrong, it was, uh, I think you caught earlier, I was, I had to get up at 6 a.m. to do a two-hour live stream from 7 to 9 with Jason Levin, then my show, uh, and then my kids um, smashed, well, I had a, a piece of furniture that's got a glass, uh, and they nearly killed themselves smashing it, and it's just like, and then, you know, so it's, it's it's a long Monday, <laughs> so yeah. I can imagine, and it, it, it... Yeah, hopefully we can end it on a good note. Uh, Cause yeah, it sounds like you were you were dealing with some of the same stuff I was dealing with. Although mine felt life threatening, but it actually wasn't. Uh, which I guess is maybe the silver lining in all of it. For listeners in the audience that may be unfamiliar with your show on T- TNT and uh, your podcast, uh, more importantly, how would you describe? Uh, each show. I'm still trying to find the answer to that question. No. Um, yeah, I mean, geopolitics and empire was just uh, born out of necessity. I don't know, just curiosity. It was just always a passion project. Just to, uh, uh, I, I sometimes I approach it in a disgruntled way. Like I just I don't even know why I do it. Uh, I could just leave it tomorrow. Sometimes I think about that, but um, I just started skyping people i wanted to talk to into my classroom like in starting in 2012 uh, and then i just thought well why don't i just make a real like a proper weekly podcast so it's just moonlighting geopolitics and empire and just looking at trying to figure out how the world works basically uh and you know i guess the the, the few common denominators i'm, I'm anti-globalist anti-war pro-freedom you know i think things most people can agree on and um and then yeah one thing led to another and I got offered in March 2022 um, the the job at TNT. So it's going to be this month. It's going to be the end of this month. It's going to be two years at, at TNT Radio. And so uh, nothing is set with TNT. You know, I was just on a call, so I came, so came late. Uh, I never, I almost never talked to a, to what do you call it, a headquarters or or is there another word for to the mothership? Um, uh, which is management. you know, no, you I call them management. Yeah. The, the uh, I, I'm I'm looking for a funkier term, but um, no news, no news is good news, you know, and so, so there are you know some changes at at TNT, and it's still a rocky operation, you know, rocky boat. Um, I'm I'm still hanging on, and so, um, it's not a given that you know TNT, you know, it's it's like you know Red Voice Media. You saw Jason Burmus was let go, of Red Voice. Um, so you know all all of these, some of these fold, uh, some of them remain, and. Yeah, so I've 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 been on uh, doing TNT for for two uh, years now. We switched to video last year, and so yeah. And then, what year did you put out the first episode of Geopolitics and Empire? So originally, like twenty, I I I start counting from twenty twelve. Uh, that's when I started skyping guests in, which was called Dissident Thinker, and that channel still is up on YouTube. It's linked to my uh, under my main geopolitics YouTube channel, and then I think around 2015, uh, that sort of when I came up with the term geopolitics uh, and empire. Okay, wow. So we're we're going on basically almost 10 years. You know, I think yeah. I think many people would qualify that as a successful endeavor. 
you know, that you have been at it this long and, you know, it still continues. It still seems like it's bringing in new listeners with each episode. And, you know, uh, is, is there an end in sight? I think about that, you know, I was hanging out with Patrick Henningsen um, of 21st Century Wire and TNT at Anarchapulco a couple of weeks back. And part of his speech was that to, to I, I'm not, I don't remember if it was just for podcasts uh, and or other um, types of work, but he said it's 10 years minimum. He, he basically said, you got to be, you got to do something for like 10 years to get good at it. Um, and so the, the cool thing for geopolitics and empire. So the, the, the plus is the status kind of thing, credibility that I get, but the minus is the financials. So right. I, I don't get as much, I can't live off of my podcast, um, uh, at least not yet. And so, but, you know, I've had on Ron Paul, um, I, even some of my guests listen to the podcast and I feel like there's a certain status that, that you know it helps me i think that's what helped me actually get a job at tnt so even if i'd done that work for free but the archive was there and that body of work actually helped land me the gig at um tnt and uh maybe even invited I haven't really been invited i've been invited on other podcasts um that uh you know maybe are like uh was it the in spanish recently i gave a talk at el mercurio the guy who works with Daniel Estulin, and they, he's got 160,000 subscribers. I did get invited to a conference, Nomad Capitalist, but I never got um, a further response. I'm kind of tired of traveling. That's the thing. They're doing it in Kuala Lumpur, and I'm like, oh, I wow. really don't want to. I don't want to travel anymore. And so, <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, you've spent the better part of uh, what most My people life. call the well, yeah, but especially during the pandemic. You know, you, you were traveling around. I remember seeing pictures of you, you know, all over the place. Yeah, I mean, I was in Kazakhstan. I was living in Kazakhstan. Then we got two months off in the summer. We, you know, go to Paris. We go to Croatia. We go back to Mexico. And, you know, travel before the COVID times, you know, it, before COVID, it's, it's, it's fine. Like, I can deal with it. But it's like now... I don't know if they're going to tomorrow declare disease X and lock everything down. I don't want to be stranded in, you know, Central Asia or who knows where. And that's the thing that sucks now. It's like they've ruined everything. Like before COVID times, like I'll go anywhere, you know, with the family and it's it's fine. And but now I just no. And then it gets tiring. You know, as you get older, you get less energy. You think it's costing. Everything's costing so much more. The flights, you know, we know mm -hmm. the Great Reset project that's intentional. Uh, and just the paperwork, you know. And now Europe is installing next year Etias system. So if you're not European, you have to. It doesn't apply to me. But again, I don't know how that works with my family. If we can just go or do I have to fill out? You have to fill out this like social credit report if you're not European and pay, pay 10 euros. But the thing is, uh, you may not be approved. Like it's, right. everything just becoming more Kafkaesque. And I'm just like. Uh, screw it. I'm just going to go to some hill uh, in rural Mexico and have a mess call and hang out. <laughs> you know? That sounds good. I'll, uh, I'll be happy to join you, especially if everything is, you know, uh, in ST was a ST HF land. Shit hits the fan. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll hang out down in the hills of, of Mexico, drinking mezcal all day, all day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's just a good time, you know. Don't threaten me with a good time. So you mentioned uh, already some of the uh, obstacles uh, that you've had placed in your path as a member of the media, and specifically one who talks about things that may not be in line with the official narrative. So again, for folks listening who may not be familiar with what you have already gone through, like how has censorship affected you and your life in the time that you've been a part of the media? Yeah, maybe not as bad as for for some people, but um, I mean, my own, what's been in a nutshell my experience? I think the biggest was probably when the COVID stuff happened. So twenty twenty. I had been the first to interview Dr. Francis Boyle January 2020 um, to get his because to get the first to get his opinion on COVID 
whatever one thinks of it. But his because he's his credibility is that he wrote the bio bioweapons um law of 1989 that became the law signed under Bush. And I, I knew of his work before. I've got some of his books. I would use his books on Middle East policy in some of my courses uh, and international relations. And I knew he had the bio warfare terror book. Uh, so I said, let's, I'm, let, let me get Boyle's take. What's going on with COVID? January 2020. And so that blew up. 300,000 views on YouTube. They took it down. I thought about it like that would have reached, that would have had millions of views, that 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 interview. It would have. Oh, yeah. Um, and that would have brought more people to my channel but they nipped that in the bud uh, then it was re-uploaded and i think it was i'm i'm estimating it was seen by millions because it was re-uploaded by great game india um and then what happened i'm, I'm getting alzheimer's because it's late in the day uh what happened um so that oh then the next day my face is on the front page of infowars and alex oh, wow. jones is doing a play-by-play -play of my interview with boyle and i still it's on my website and my media uh category i put the link to that actual band video clip from 2020 where jones is playing me <laughs> interviewing boyle which was hilarious uh for me like i feel like all these are little badges of honor like i've achieved um you know this is why i say earlier like i i i'm happy to just walk away from podcasting because i i've met ron paul i've i've met colonel douglas from mcgregor i've interviewed them uh, G. Edward Griffin took me out to lunch over a decade ago. Oh, wow. And it's just like I've interviewed all of my intellectual heroes, the Daniela Gansers of Na Operation Gladio, uh, Johan Galtung, who just passed at 93 years of age. I've interviewed him twice. And it's just like William Engdahl over a half dozen times. And it's, for me, it's just like I have I feel like I've gotten to the top of the mountain and I've talked to all these people that were my heroes. And I'm like, I don't care anymore. I can go sell tacos. Like, honestly. But um, going back to the Boyle thing, um then they did a hit so what that was 2020 and then what happens 2021 the associated press and that's linked on my website the associated press did a hit piece on so the timeline it's interesting i think july of 2020 i got an email from some ap reporter and he it was weird because he's like uh, you did the interview with boyle and i want to i want to know more about you and I'm like, well, that's weird. Who cares about me? And that, I never even put my name on my podcast until people were like, who are you? Who are you? What's your name? Because I'm like, it's not about me. It's about the idea of the person that I'm interviewing, right? Who cares about me? Uh, and so the guy, I, I knew right away it's Associated Press. He wants to do a hit piece. I don't want to, I, I said, I don't talk to MSM basically. And so sure enough, I'd said no. And then a month later, it was a story about conspiracy theorists. Mm -hmm. uh, and then so that same guy from AP, uh, 2021 does a hit piece on the COVID conspiracy dudes hitting uh, Francis Boyle mentions geopolitics and empire. And that article was co-written with Atlantic council, which is the N NATO's think tank. Right. And then a week later, I think more or less I get banned from Patreon. So, um, and they said, you have to delete your interview with Robin Monotti and Dr. Mark circus, who's a cool guy. He lives down in Brazil alternative. He's like, kind of like a Marcola type. They said, delete those two interviews from the entire internet. We don't want to see it anywhere on the internet. And if you don't do that, you sorry, we can't. You're, you're terminated from Patreon. And so it just remained frozen like that um, until last year. And it, it, it had been in its frozen state until the last year. And I just terminated the account because I couldn't use it. It said under review. Uh, and so there was that and then april of 2022 when they rolled out this information governance board and you know you're mm -hmm. familiar with nina yankowitz oh yeah that yeah. week that week um i got a, i got banned from paypal uh and it was consortium news mint press news myself and i think Caleb Caleb maupin who does work for rt and i got a message from kim iverson she covered that on the hill uh she showed my screenshots with my name and geopolitics and empire uh and then that was right before she left the hill. And then Matt Taibbi, I got a DM from him asking me about it. And I, uh, I, he mentioned that in his sub stack. And then then later I realized, you know, Mike Benz, a little, a lot of people are familiar with Mike Benz. Yeah. Um, through his foundation for freedom work, looking at some of his documents. Then I put two and two together. So I explained to people like, it's uh, when you read the stuff, then you read this. Then I understood what really happened. It was the DHS and their sub-agency, I think, called CISA, mm -hmm. DHS told PayPal 
to ban us. And that's why when I log into my PayPal, it says you're a risk. You can't use PayPal anymore. They won't even let me shut it down. They like, called customer service. Like, Close my PayPal account. No, we can't. It's going to remain like this frozen forever. Like, what the heck? And then you realize it's political persecution. So they can't say you're a political risk because that would ruin the facade that America is a democracy and liberty. And so this is like fascist, you know, Nazi Soviet style stuff. And mm -hmm. so they say, oh, you're just a risk. Sorry, you can't. It, you know, blah. And th there was that. And then, you know, YouTube keeps striking. And then I think a couple of months, two months back, my for the first time, my podcast hosting provider, SoundCloud, they took down my episode with biotech consultant Christy Grace. That's the first time that's happened. So, oh, wow. So, not even SoundCloud is safe, is what it sounds like. Nope. They're based in Germany and they said they'll do it again. And they said, if, if, I, if I do it again, if I cross their community guidelines, they will, um, I guess, take down my entire podcast. And so, I, I, at, at this point, yeah, I don't know what to do. And even Amazon recently, I interviewed J. Michael Waller, who was former CIA, who wrote the book called Big Intel, which we talked about. And I tried to leave a review for his book. I bought the book on Kindle, even though I got it for free previously through the publisher. And I leave a review. Nothing strange. You know, I was talking about his book. And Amazon, for the first time, it was like a month ago, says, uh, you start, we can't publish this review and they give a list, hate speech, blah, 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 all that ridiculous stuff. It's like a book. I'm reviewing oh, wow. a, a political science book. What are you talking about? Hate, woke, like uh, hate speech. I, I can probably find, I can pull up uh, the list. And I, I, they, re, I, I'm, I think reluctantly they uh, submitted my s second uh, review, but they said, if you do it again, like you'll be banned here. It says we couldn't post your review because it doesn't meet our guidelines for one or more of these reasons. Profanity. There was no profanity harassment. There was no harassment. I'm talking about the guy's book, hate speech, sexual content. We're talking about the CIA and FBI. What sexual content? Uh, illegal well, actually, activity. Actually, have you ever heard of Operation Climax or boy? <laughs> no, I haven't actually. What a... <laughs> it was a CIA operation. Seriously? Yeah, it was part of MK Ultra. Midnight what Climax, that that's what it was. Operation Midnight Climax. Yeah, CIA is all about sex. Anyway, I'm sorry I interrupted you. Yeah, and so, uh, yeah, I'm just summarizing my experience with censorship. And it said illegal activity. I guess if you if that refers to the illegal activity of the CIA and FBI, okay. But, and private information. Uh, and so, yeah, that's that's been, you know, people are getting debanked now. Right, Jeremy McKenzie, military veteran in, in Canada, Scotia Bank, and then he can't do any other banks in Canada. I think Nigel Farage, if I understand right, Maria Z, Maria Zadic, I think is her last name. I think she's of Serbian extraction in Australia, if I'm not mistaken. I think she had a bank account shut. And so, yeah. Well, and there have been others at. as well. Uh, Mercola, you know. Yeah, Mercola. Being the, is... the biggest one in our community. Yeah, Alina Lip in Germany, although she's in Ukraine now. Graham Phillips in the UK. Um, yeah, Trump. <laughs> well, yeah, that's that's different though. I think uh, that's that's similar to uh, like when Russell Brand was was having troubles with his bank, or maybe Kanye would be the other uh, big example. I don't know that there's a whole lot of uh, genuine action going on in uh, any of those cases myself, uh, but that's just my opinion. So yeah. how have you or have you uh, adapted your approach at all as a result uh, of the censorship that's been brought upon you? Um. It's tough. You roll with the punches. It's like I look at it as decentralized guerrilla warfare. Um it was tough with the when you kept getting the YouTube strikes. I would get up to two strikes. You almost lose the channel. It's like, yeah, people say, who cares about YouTube? But then it becomes tough to grow the podcast, really. Like, I feel it's getting so hard now. I feel like there's some backdoor button, like a volume knob where they can just decrease, like, what do you call it? Shadow um, visibility shadow filter. That's something what Linda, like that. Yeah, that's what Linda Yaccarino calls it. But across the board, like even on Telegram, like honestly, there was a time where I was growing steadily on Telegram and all of a sudden it's like it stopped. And I feel like 
internet wide, not just like Twitter, like Telegram. People think mm -hmm. I don't. I think Telegram is compromised totally. There's, oh, yeah. For me, there's no doubt about it. Um, I use it because whatever I I can. Like that's that guerrilla mindset. So be on whatever platform you can be on until you're nuked. And I feel a certain satisfaction getting deplatformed. You know, I've said I'm going to use Facebook, face, Facebook until they delete my account. And I'm like, I, I want to get that badge. You know, I was <laughs> taken off of there. And so um, with YouTube, I would just po post like a short clip and then um, try to direct people off world right to rumble or, or odyssey um but it's it's getting tougher you know and i just mentioned now they're trying to get come to podcast hosting providers i did switch my web host to epic with a k i mean those were the guys who were i think like still posting gab and Infowars. and then rob monster was a ceo i liked him because he's christian but then like a year or two ago something wacky happened they almost like collapsed and so huh. I don't know what's going on. They're still surviving, but they're not the epic that they were before. Like you go to their website, they scale down a lot of their services. They had trouble. Um, you don't hear anything from Rob Monster. And so it's it's tough. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. Well, I, I can echo that sentiment because uh, I've been trying to expand the footprint of Liberty Radio for quite some time. And I'm always looking for, you know, like the platform that we haven't touched yet that's probably getting overlooked by most everybody else as well, right? Just to kind of get that foot in the door early. But there's nothing out, there's nothing out there anymore, you know? It, it's getting to the point where I may have to go back on what I said two years ago when I said that Liberty Radio would never be on TikTok, and start making TikToks because that's where all the attention is right now. I, I've been actually wanting to go on TikTok, but that's my thing. Like I'm, what, what everything that I'm doing now is like my max capacity. I'm a skeleton crew, right? A one man revolution, and so it's just like I want to do TikTok, but I just it's not humanly um, possible. And then again, you don't, you never know how the growth will go there that one thing could lead to another. Th that's the thing with, with this, like I ended up on TNT. If I didn't, I maybe would have done, um, other things, you know? And so it's just for the time being, um, I'm doing what I'm doing, but, uh, I kind of lost taste with COVID and, you know, Instagram, I was posting for a while, but I don't even care about it anymore. Cause it's just like they're, they censor why well, spend my time on, on, on that. So, <laughs> Yeah. No, I hear you on that. So when I was on your show, what was that? Uh, back in January, I think, when I was uh, hanging out at the uh, the local hotel or yeah, whatever it was, I can't even remember at this point. Um, you asked me what I thought 2024 was going to look like, uh, and I believe I, I gave you a, a pretty vague general answer at that time that, that somehow or another actually ended up making its way into a clip uh, that came out of that appearance later on. I think I could be yeah, misremembering. I um, yeah, I posted a clip. Yeah. But now that we're almost a full quarter into the new calendar, I know, right? Now that we're at that point, what do you think the other nine months of this year? hold for those of us that, that dwell in the collective insanity. You know, it's interesting. I've been thinking in my head, trying to remember the patterns, what you laid out, I think pretty elo eloquently I have the clip here. You said, I expect 2024 is going to be like nothing we've seen so far. The pattern that has been established since January 1st, 2020 is that as the propaganda campaign continues to roll out, it has to get bigger, more absurd, more spectacular, has to continually wow you with its level of absurdity. Take 2016, take 2020, even 2000, and roll those up together in a big old fat spliff. And that's what we're going to get in 2024, pedal to the metal. And if I had a number of guests on, um, echo that same sentiment. You know, I had on Curtis Stone, the urban farmer, he pretty much... Well, I am a trendsetter. He, yeah, yeah. And so, or, you know, Curtis Stone, I had on a guy called Brandon Weikart. Um, last week, he echoed the same sentiment. Jeremy Ryan Slate, who I've interviewed, pretty much said the same thing. And it's just like everyone's coming to that same 
conclusion I, I forget who i was talking to recently who was uh, saying to the tune this is the thing because i don't even know in time and space where i am anymore what sometimes i ask people like what year is it uh because i talk to so many people daily and so many things to think about the kids smashing up the house and just like are, are they gonna kill themselves <laughs> like i gotta keep them alive and so um uh yeah th so i think it's gonna be nuts i mean it feels like the system's coming down like the financial stuff like it's it's hurting me that the dollar the peso is strengthening and the dollar right. is weakening um that's causing me pain and um you're seeing just the pattern recognition more reports daily of cyber events um the, the and just more rhetoric like this week just off the top of my head maduro in, in venezuela saying it's the end of the empire so many people around the world like this if you think about it it's like this orchestra uh now of people saying it's the end of the empire you know, what everyone thinks of bricks or multipolarity, you know, we can get into that discussion. I don't buy it, but nevertheless, it, it's it is like the decline of the West. And it's almost like the, the American financial system is going to collapse. And um, and then, the, yeah, I think it's going to be nuts and they might start war, like real war. You know, it seems like they're pre preparing to go like really go to war with like World War Three style with Russia. That That kind of just feels like that's in the air the like a real direct conflict confrontation um and then with when if that goes off we're off to the races it's like everything's on the table now um there's talk of nukes and then the economic stuff and you know people that i interview like daniel rancourt who say covid was a war simulation almost you know who knows i mean yeah. Uh, have you changed any of your pro prognostic? Uh, how do you say uh, <laughs> prognostications? Yes. Um, mm, no, uh, I haven't, unfortunately. Um, and so far, it seems like the events that we've seen so far this year have uh, held to that forecast, unfortunately. Because uh, again, this is one of those things where I don't necessarily want to be right about it. I'm just looking at the progression of events and where it's heading. You know, it doesn't take a genius to figure these things out. Um, but since, you know, we're on the subject already and geopolitics is your wheelhouse, uh, based on the military action that we've seen over the past couple of years, not just between Ukraine and Russia, but now also unfolding in the Middle East, I mean... Is there like a, a a timeline that you can throw down as as far as the powder keg being set off, or is or is it going to be like what we're told how World War One unfolded, where it was just these things kept happening and then all of a sudden we were at war? Yeah, that second scenario sounds about right. Like I don't have a, any feeling where I can say it's this year or next. I I just I I got no feeling on that some of the people that i've talked to said like from 2025 to 2030 is the, the more of the danger zone but um it seems like yeah maybe they're not ready yet it, you 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 do also see that it seems like the west is they feel like they're not quite ready yet like you you know they're planning to they're, they're going to they want to but we need like six more months another year or two to you know shore up certain defenses but it's weird because you see in america things um they their their recruitment numbers are super low uh there's no money the strategic petroleum what do you call it a reserve is just they're draining it they're emptying mm -hmm. it they're flooding the country it's almost like it, this lends well, a little credence. just the united states it's other western nations are are following uh that same policy and you know, then you gotta hand it to you know the i'm not sure how familiar with you are with like the joel scosens scosens and uh jeff nyquists out there who talk about An anatoly golitsyn and how there was this fake soviet collapse and that the communists this communist plot to feign their collapse and then work long term more like yuri bezmenov style to mm -hmm. infiltrate the west and have it like do basically self-immolation so it, it it you know it falls on its own sword and then they come in and it's almost looking like that like honestly you know and i and i listen to everyone and i take you know jeff knife who i've interviewed and and he said that you know there's no way america took out jfk it was the russians and i'm like 
there's no way I can buy that story. Right. But I I take I put that aside. That's my approach with my podcast. I talk to everyone. It's like, okay, I'll okay, Jeff, Nyquist, sorry. I mean, you're you're a really smart guy. I I I like the work that he does, but I'm gonna I don't believe that, sorry. But what you're talking about with Galitzin and this communist stuff, I feel like there's something there, you know, uh, that I can't discard. Um so it seems like the West is doing a stand down. Yeah. And and maybe they're waiting for the Russians and the Chinese to build up and then <laughs> go on the offensive. But I feel like it's a 100-year it's storm. You know, I think we're going to be seeing what shades of what we've seen in the 19-teens, as you allude to, or the 1940s. Mm. Uh, and maybe even a combination of all those time periods. Because again, it's it's never that history actually repeats itself, but the same patterns persist over time, the outcomes just look slightly different because you've got different variables in each era. Uh, but as far as, as far as the communists trying to take over the world, it, you always have, I think we always have to be careful when we start throwing terms around because people can appear as communists without actually being adherents of the ideology, right? Like take, for example, the international bankers who will essentially uh, put forth any facade that they need to in order to accomplish whatever goal it is that they're working on at that time. They, um, they adopt and discard ideologies pretty much at will uh, in order to you know, just forward their, their own agenda. So I, I, can, I can see communism being a part of it. Um, but not necessarily from like a true believer standpoint, right? Like it's it's not the kids that are out in the street, uh, you know, protesting against the the bourgeoisie that are that are bringing an end to the American Empire. It's something else that kind of looks and smells like communism. Like I can I can get on that train of thought absolutely. No, no, I think you're spot on. That that's how I see it as well. I don't uh, this. So this is what I mean when I talk like about people like Joel Skelson or Jeff Nyquist, where it has the the. I I'm using it maybe for just expediency, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's on the surface, yeah, it's communist, but I I don't think it, it's it's uh, you know Brandon Weikart, who I talked to last. Um, he spoke at CPAC. He's he's got interesting books. Um, disagree on some things, but. He says all of the isms of the 20th century congealed into one, like ism, you know, globalism. And I think it's like mm -hmm. these elites, I think you're right. I think they are like into the occult, that they have their own like occult ideology. But when it comes to the isms that we're talking about, I think it's just as you say, they put them on like suits and take them off. So it's communism for us and technocracy for us. But for them, it's just money and power. You yeah. know, they, they have all the control of the money and then and, and the decision making but and we get the and we get all of the variations we get a bit of fascism we get a bit of communism we get a bit of scientific dictatorship uh we get a bit of globalism it's like this new beast um yeah so i, I totally uh, agree with you i don't think these elites really when it comes to these isms i don't think they really care i i think their real beliefs are like uh, more occult right yeah yeah, I, I would totally agree with that. I, I think what they actually believe is what they hide from us continually over time. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's why when you start getting a little bit too close to, to those practices and, and those, those belief systems, they start bringing the hammer around, right? Because we can't, that's the stuff we really can't talk about. Like we can talk about aliens, we 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 can talk about uh, child sex trafficking. We we can talk about baby blood drinking, even right. And and we're not going to get a slap on the wrist from anybody for any of that stuff. But if we start talking about, for instance, you know how the Rockefellers went into China in the 1920s and actually laid the groundwork for the quote unquote opening up of China. 50 years later by Kissinger and Nixon, you know, then, then we start getting the, the wrong kind of attention. Yeah. You know, it's a shame that we haven't had so many people explore those lines. You know, one of the problems is again, it takes a lot of time 
energy and money and it's you're not gonna the problem is it's 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 got to be someone who ha who already is financially doing well that can afford to dig into that but you know if like you're talking about it you know anthony sutton right carol quigley in some ways patrick wood um i'm i think richard grove and and um chris milligan of trine day uh, i've interviewed him the the founder of trine day and you know his dad was like cia or something and he he has talked about well, what you just mentioned uh, he, he talks about how the u.s went into china and that helped prop it up so yeah yeah, I mean, uh, there's there's very clear evidence that Mao's revolutionaries were actually being funded by Wall Street. And again, this is this is beyond the funding of the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, and it's after the funding of uh, the Third Reich in Germany. The exact same people, you know, were then basically setting up Red China or what would eventually be a showdown with the West, whether that was the dominant power of the United States or however it looked at that time, that seems to be the dialectic that they were trying to set up even, you know, a hundred years ago. And, and I, we're just kind of living the result of that at this point. As I watched that interview on Tucker Carlson with she Van Fleet, I think mm -hmm. was her name. And I almost, I laughed out loud because in the end, Tucker was going to call her Xi Jinping. He stopped himself. He said Xi Jin, Xi, Xi Van Fleet. And I was like, ah, oh. because the, we're the only she that we're used to saying is Xi Jinping. And so when you have Xi Van Fleet, it's funny, it's in the last part. Um, but she was talking about how what she's seeing now in the U.S. is what she saw in Mao's time and i think it's because it is it's as you say it's the same people behind the facade and you can trace i feel like you can trace a lot of the this evolution of this gnostic occult um thing that we're experiencing is french revolution right this jacobin mm. french revolution type stuff the, is the fabians yeah it's fabians it's freemasons it's it's jacobins it's um do away with kings like thrones and and, and religion um and set up this you know antichrist type um system which includes marx and and it's not you know i like james Lindsay, who's an atheist he he's i think he said good stuff about this where he says it's marxism there's it's not really a thing it's it's just like it's this gnostic cult where they've created these things like marxism as vehicles to do what they want so it's not like they even really care about Marxism, they're just like going back to what you're saying, they're vehicles being used by these this Gnostic cult. And it's harder to get more specific because as you say, I think we we can't ever know fully exactly what these freaks are into. <laughs> well, and uh, I think if it obviously if it was public knowledge, all of this would disappear tomorrow. I, I don't think the majority of the public would know uh, or would uh would allow this to continue. And again, maybe it's, it's me being hopeful and a little bit naive, but I don't think the majority of the people would know or, or would allow the depth of depravity that some of us have been able to catch a glimpse of as, as outsiders peering in. Like, I don't think they would allow it to continue, but again, you know, maybe that's wishful thinking on my part because it seems like the everything that rolled out with uh, the COVID regime, where they they started rolling back individual rights on, almost immediately as soon as the calendar ticked over into January on 2020, you know, people just again kept going along to get along. So I don't know, maybe not because we are seeing the mask drop considerably, even in the mainstream media. But at least in the United States, there still doesn't seem to be much public outcry. You know, I, I've got, I've got a more pessimistic uh, take where I you know I think about this from time to time and just make I, I observe a lot whether it's my guests or just being out and about. And I feel like most when you say most people wouldn't um, tolerate it or, or how did you put it um, put up with this, yeah. I kind of feel like they would i've kind of got this impression where you know people say this that it takes a irate minority right a 
critical mass. So where it's only like, you know, 15% or 20%. So, it's, you know, forget the, the rest of the masses. And so I feel like that's more true. I feel like you know, if I'm just walking around Mexico, you know, I still talk to people. There's like a whole swath of people who have no idea about any of this. Even if you told them, they just like shrug because they got to go, you know, make a living uh take care of the kids and it's just like you know just for example over the weekend i was talking to some mexicans i interviewed this the the director of the acton institute who recently met with eduardo verastegui who i think he he was involved in the sound of freedom movie um and he was trying to run for president of mexico and he retweeted uh that video with me interviewing his his acquaintance uh the head of the acton institute and I told some, you know, with some Mexicans over the weekend, and I'm like, hey, you know, this Eduardo Verastegui guy um, shared my video, and they barely knew who he was. Y you know what I'm saying? So it's just kind of my that my impression where I think it would take, uh, I think people are accustomed to taking, to to taking it. You know, like Soviet Union, you know, or any regime. Most people went along um, to get along. And it's not until that irate minority, until the system collapses on itself. Uh, and maybe that's a result of pressure from that irate minority or critical mm -hmm. mass. But I kind of feel like, um, you know, the masses are just sleeping. Um, yeah, I don't know. So there, I mean, it sounds like what you observe in people is that they are expecting to be led. Yeah. 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 Seems like, I mean, most people seem to be like that. It's most people will find it easier to work for someone than be an entrepreneur to be their own boss. And it's not, you know, necessarily a bad thing. I even feel like that sometimes where it's easier to just go to nine to five than figure out how to, you know, be your own boss. And so, you know, th there is there does seem to be an instinct there for that. Yeah, I, I can, I can, uh, I can understand that. It's, uh, doesn't help the system crumble any faster, but, um, I don't know. It, it agrees with, with my own, uh, theory of human behavior is you can't have more, uh, leader types than follower types. Otherwise society is just going to collapse anyway. Because everybody's just going to go in their own direction, and nothing's ever going to get accomplished. Yeah, I mean, that, I mean, it makes it makes perfect sense. But then you know, going back to, we maybe wouldn't even need the masses to make change. Again, it's like historically, it's always been the minority, right, the, of that critical mass. And I don't know where that is. Is it 15 percent, twenty, thirty? I, I, I don't, I don't know. Uh, it, it may just come down to proliferation of ideas, right? Maybe. It, because I think one of the reasons that they have gone so heavy with censorship in this decade, not that it wasn't happening prior to 2020, it absolutely was, uh, but it got, it got a lot stronger uh, when we got into the decade of the 20s. And it was because they know that if better ideas than what they're putting forth are allowed to proliferate, that their ideas are going to die in the court of public opinion. It's, it's impossible for them to be able to survive against better ideas because their flaws will be exposed in the process of discourse, right? So it's why we have to put all these controls on speech now. Um, I don't know. It, that's what makes sense to me. No, yeah, the, the, it does make sense that they accelerated that um... Because maybe if they hadn't, kind of, I think, as you allude to, more people would have seen it. And so, like, we, we have to do something now. And, and, right. and they have done. Yeah. Yeah. So who's the next president of Mexico going to be? I think it's going to be Shane Baum. Yeah. That's my guess. What Still, makes you say that? Like, because it's like, who else? Uh, I don't follow this stuff as closely, but, you know, a few of the people that are tuned into this or Mexicans that I've interviewed are asked. It's like, everyone says Shane. I mean, you can sort of tell, um, and you know, Mexico is kind of a, a smaller world than the U S mm -hmm. and here it's just like, who else but Shane Bob? She's like AMLO's right hand woman. And, um, 
none of the other candidates seem to have much social currency and they're not as well known. Um, and so it just seems like she's going to slip in. And so, yeah. Well, I'll tell you, uh, <laughs> I kind of already knew that answer. Just from the time that I spent down in Acapulco and the amount of times that I saw her name prominently displayed all over the place. Yeah. Like there, there was a heavy push, even in a non-election year, to make sure that people knew her name. You just reminded me, yeah, because I was at uh, Acapulco and I did see Scheinbaum posters. So, yeah. Yeah, there was in the uh, the complex that I was living at over in uh, Diamante, uh, there was a, a, a cinder block wall across the street from the entry to the complex because I lived in a gated community. Um, and, you know, shops down one side of the street, shops down the other side of the street, so I would always be out walking the street. It was like every, every third panel in that wall would have her, her name painted on it. And I mean, just going down the street for kilometers. I, I've never seen anything like that before in the United States. I was like, oh, okay. I see what they're doing. It, it just seems logical. Like um, you need the money machine behind you. And if you're these other candidates, like I said, they, they, it, it doesn't feel like they have this momentum. We don't, I don't know who they are. Uh, they don't have as many posters as you mentioned. So it just seems like, more logical that it's it's going to be her because she's she's the machine is behind her. So. Yeah. And do you think the the average Mexican is going to be okay with having a Jewish president? I'm gonna have to start asking more Mexicans about this. Uh, uh, I don't know. I haven't really talked about it much because I think on the one hand. You've got a segment of Mexicans that like don't even care who's president. They're like mm -hmm. almost like natural. Uh, I don't know what you call it, anarchists. Or like, look, I just gotta go do my work, and I care. I don't. Care. I care about other things, right? Um, whatever they are, just they're not like politics, or or they know that the system sucks, and I'm just gonna clock in and do my work, get buy my food, and enjoy sports or art or other other things. Who cares about politics? And so I think that's I think that's even not a bad way of <laughs> looking at it. Um, and others, I think, uh, yeah, I, I do. I am friends with another group of Mexicans who who do point this out. And I, I, you know, even my, I've, and I'm, you know, for whatever the whole Jewish thing, I'm approaching it objectively. We're like, look, I'm, I'm ethnically Croatian. I'm a Slav. My name literally means crow up my blood. I'm, I'm, I'm Croatian ethnically. I'm a naturalized Mexican citizen. Even if I, and you know, I did, I studied international relations. I was just curious. I looked it up. Like, would I be able to now that I'm a Mexican citizen work in the Mexican foreign service? I, I can't. So I can't work in the Mexican for, foreign service as a naturalized Mexican because you have to be born here for, for some, for a job like that. Mm. And I, no, obviously I couldn't be Mexican president, but if I, let's say I had been born here in Mexico, my parents emigrated from Croatia. I still would feel like I, I shouldn't be president. It'd be kind of strange for like ethnic Croat. And I, I believe there's only one race, you know, I, I don't care if people make fun of me. I, you know, Ken Ham of Answers in Genesis. Uh, I really like him. He says there's only one race. And not multiple races. It's just a different pigmentation of the skin if you're darker or lighter color. So I kind of actually believe that it's one race. So I don't think there's even different races. And but the thing is, it's just kind of odd. To, I guess it's not race, but more ethnic or or cultural. But um, I I would find it odd for me to be president of Mexico if I'm Croatian, like ethnically. So that's why I still I would find it odd for Scheinbaum to be you know Jewish president of Mexico or any other right group i i think it should be someone who's got many generations um in in the country and so so yeah there have been mexicans who said have pointed out pointed this out and said that they're not happy um with it so it's, it's interesting that that there's already um a contingent 
that feels that way. Um, cause it, again, it was something that I always wanted to, to talk with the local people in Acapulco about, but I never got my Spanish good enough to, to where I could actually like hold my own in a, in a, that type of in-depth conversation. Uh, mine was, was better for, you know, like ordering food, but so you just came back from an Acapulco, not like today but uh very very recently uh what were your impressions of the event because this was your first time going wasn't it yeah um i was a greater reset last in january that that had been my second time this was my first time to anarchapulco and i walked up to jeff spoke for a minute or two you know i i years ago i wrote for dollar vigilante for fun under the pseudonym jorge gato george camp frequently we get reposted to Lou Rockwell. I mean, those articles I think are still up. I just like for fun, I don't know, as an outlet. Uh, so I just told Jeff, Hey, you know, I remember Jorge Gato. That was me. I don't know if he came up with that pseudonym or someone else, but um, it was fun. It was like, cause I was staying right in front of Max Egan's house and right in front of his bar the crow house and so we go there almost every night and to the wee hours of the night i'm talking to um you know patrick henningson who's got a show on tnt his his brother some people other attendees who were at greater reset or listen to my podcast or tnt show uh, david avocado wolf you know i follow his meme channel it's funny that i took a photo with him i told him he sh it's still on his channel he shared my martin armstrong video from 2020 it's still there that he shared it on his telegram and so he was playing the drums max egan's playing guitar steve falconer's singing the blues um yeah i met mariam hanane who i've interviewed and it's just like you know, hanging out with charlie robinson so yeah it was, that was all a lot of fun the there's a, a lot of sun it was really burning mm -hmm. us so they didn't have protection from that but I, I guess my thing that I kind of, I don't know what to think of it is just because I'm a Christian, right? And so I, and I, I read everything, the cults, I read all this, all everything, you know, all this sort of stuff, Marx, Marxism, you know, I'll, I'm interested in everything, but I just saw the pattern of at Anarchapulco and at Greater Reset, but more so even at Anarchapulco, a lot of the new age stuff, like mm -hmm. Gnosticism, new age, theosophy, one presenter even quoted Aleister Crowley as above, so below. And so oh, wow. I'm noticing this trend and I've been talking about it with some of my guests where um, you're seeing it now from alt media seep out this sort of um, new age stuff. And so that, that kind of really struck me. So Interesting. Cause I, I did pick up uh a bit of a new age vibe from a lot of the expat anarchists that I interacted with uh, down in Acapulco. And again, just me uh, stating my opinion, I found it very off-putting because of what I know about the new age movement, how it came into being and, you know, what its intended purpose is, which is essentially to be the new one world religion to accompany the one world government. Um, that, so. That's my thing. And, you know, maybe you're, you're coming at it from a not Christian perspective, but I'm coming at it from a Christian, but it's the same conclusion. And the elites, you know, Brandon Smith of Alt Market, who gets, you know, he does good work. He's uh, on Zero Hedge off. And he just wrote an article about that, saying how the religion or philosophy of the elites is theosophy how Helena Blavatsky and Ellis Bailey mm -hmm. in the late 1800s were penetrating the elites of society. They were getting into this stuff. And in any case, I think even, you know, I, I believe in a literal Satan or, or Lucifer running the show. Um, and naturally the elites would have this ideology. You know, I've been to Lutz's Trust uh, in Geneva. They've got three Lutz's Trust, which is, so you had Helena Blavatsky, she had a, a Lucifer magazine, and then uh, the secret doctrine, all that. And then Alice Bailey was like her disciple who founded in 1922 the Lucifer Publishing, which changed its name to Lucifer's Trust, which has three offices, New York, London, and Geneva. I went to one of their meetings in Geneva, 
And I've got the pamphlet here from 2009 where they're talking about Prometheus and Lucifer. Lucifer is basically like Prometheus. He's the good yeah. guy. Well, it's the so same character arc. It's the same. You study uh, on their own website and the newsletters. They talk about Lucifer is the Messiah. He's the Christ. The Christian worldview, that's, well, that means he's the Antichrist. And they say that uh, this Lucifer figure is here now. We're preparing for his return. He's going to be the Maitreya to the Eastern mysticists. He's going to be the Mahdi to the Muslims, you know, the, the second coming in the Muslim world. He's going to be the Christ to the Christians. It's what they believe. And um, now you see that's like as above, so below, right? From the top down, that's the theosophy view, the, the occult ideology. Now now you're seeing it come from bottom up, from alt media. So, so this is the thing. You see the shift where like 20 years ago, alt media was like 9-11, Federal Reserve, you know, certain things like that. And now it's kind of like on the spectrum, it's gone to, you know, price consciousness, oneness, frequency. We're in a living in a simulation. The earth is flat. Viruses don't exist. QAnon. Um, and, you know, not everyone believes in all of that, but I'm just kind of exaggerating here. And and um, you can, you, basically they say you can be God. That's the mm -hmm. this philosophy. So you don't need God. You don't need Jesus. You you can um, heal your tr inner trauma, so not your sin. You you um, you can do it yourself. You don't need Jesus, so you can reach reach Christ consciousness yourself. And, and what what I don't like is they're not open about it. Some of the alt media or New Age people, it's like you know I say I'm a Christian, but you know I talk to everyone. This is where I'm coming from, just so you know. And they're they're like secretly they're Theosophy New Agers in mm -hmm. alt media. And maybe witting, maybe some of them unwittingly, but that's kind of the thing where, I, and I'm totally ideologically opposed to this view. And so, so I'm kind of running up now in my mind friction where some of these people I interview, um, I respect everyone, you know, I, I don't like to argue or, or, or debate, but it's just kind of ca causing a bit of internal friction for me. <laughs> well, I, I can imagine, especially approaching it from, a Christian perspective because again that's that's kind of what scripture is there to do right is to help you identify the evil that exists in this world so that you know where temptation is likely to come from right that that was always my interpretation of it you know it's it's there to help you find all the traps that are being laid for us as we try to make our way through this realm yeah, it's that extreme discernment. And, and it's kind of like what I'm talking about. I, I feel like that this is actually what's warned in the Bible, like to be insanely discerning. Uh, and I talk about this every week with Terry Wolf, my Canadian guest, and he's, he, uh, he sees this the same way. And it's just kind of like it's part of that theory of I don't know if, you, if, if you'd followed Donnie Darkens, who's got a big account mm -hmm. on, on yeah. Twitter. And he says, and it makes sense because we're sold this image that, it's Diablo with horns, right? And the right. new world order. And that is the Antichrist system. But you're like, well, wait a minute. The Bible says that it's going to be so deceptive that it's going to trick even like the, the Christians, like even like the hardcore, hardcore Christians. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, then that means that the devil's not going to come with the horns and all that. Right. It's like, we're, we'll see it from a mile away. So how are Christians and others, you know, discerning people going to be fooled it's not going to be the klaus schwab new world order so i think again it goes back to with my jeff Nike nyquist thing or with donnie darken where i think he's on to something his whole theory may not be exactly right but he's he's something is there that he's talking about and so he says that you know you've got um the great reset versus the great awakening mm -hmm. and he says the great awakening is the false light right and that, you know, maybe, you know, Trump comes back or whatever, and maybe QAnon turns out to be true. And he def he comes back and he pulls out of NATO and says no to Davos. And it's the Great Awakening. We're winning. We've defeated the NWO. And it's like, no, this is the real New World Order. Yeah. You know, this is the New World Order. And I, I think that might play out. Again, I, maybe it won't. Maybe Danny Darkin will be wrong, but... I feel like that makes more sense. If I were the devil, I'd do that. <laughs> no, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, no, it, it, yes, because the, the people that need to be fooled the most are the ones that are going to fight against, again, the obvious evil. 
So you need to have something that is going to catch those folks and funnel them right back to where you want them to go. Yeah, it makes absolute sense to me, which is why I have always been highly critical of some other figures in the media, right? Because it's like you, you'll be watching them and they'll be displaying a specific behavior pattern. And then all of a sudden, for no particular reason whatsoever, they go off into left field and then come back. And it's like, wait a minute, what was that? Wait, what, what were you talking about there? About like some sort of control structure or something? Some digital ID, some digital money? What was that? Yeah. I think that there are a multitude uh, of traps that are laid for us, both both uh, Christian and non, right? That are meant to essentially harvest your energy and put it towards the work of the agenda. And the the way to get people to willingly give up their energy is to provide them with an image that is appealing to them, that they can give that energy to. It's almost like idolatry, you know? And it's like you even say Christian traps. Like, I don't believe in the rapture, uh, right. that there's, it's not even in the Bible. And then you, you, know, you talk about, was it Darby and Schofield? And yeah, yeah, okay, we get, I, get, I get all that, you know? The, and, um, or, or even like the people who just, I, I poke fun, but you know, the, 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 the no virus stuff or 5g stuff where it's just like, but that's all they talk about. Right. You know? And it's just like, or even you, flat go, earthers. let's go ahead and throw that, the flat earthers in there. Or, or even, you know, my own experience, I was obsessed for too long with prophecy. And it's just like, I, I realized and you're buying these Christian books and then you realize half of these authors are just rubbish. And it's just like, I'm spending too much time thinking about prophecy when I should be doing other things like, yeah, it's interesting, but you can have a balance. And so it's just like, like kind of like you said, we're, we're expending too much energy on that ends. Uh, and we got to get out of that dead end and do, do other stuff. Absolutely. So knowing all of this and seeing the world, the way that you see it, which, you know, obviously is going to be different from the average person. I think we've already established that. Um, and I don't think that's a bad thing necessarily. It just means that you're more aware of yourself and your interaction with uh, the world around you. But knowing all of this, how do you in your everyday life work towards uh, safeguarding and protecting yourself and your family against these trends that you're seeing develop in the world? Um, well, you know, some of them I've tried. Some of them were because of the stuff we're talking about. Others are just because they're common sense. Like first thing I was all on about was just getting out of debt. Right? So I don't have any debt. So just got out of debt. My house paid it off. I'm out of debt. I think like it's a big thing, right? Uh, most yeah. people, I think a lot of people still are not there, right? You know, they've got car loan, house, mortgage, whatever. And so out of debt. And then, yeah, I like, I like minimalism. I always viewed when I read the Bible first, for me, intuitively, it was like prescribed a minimalist lifestyle. You know, you read the New Testament and the apostles and it's just like, they have a minimalist lifestyle. <laughs> They're not, you know, collecting mansions and so then you know i learned about the minimalist movement and so i think that's helpful being agile and then the network you know i view having a social network or wherever you live um whatever whatever clubs you're parts of us or social cliques or tribes um you know having a network of people you could fall back on when the tomato hits the fan and and then just making progress wherever you can. You know, I gotta get a Google phone. You you know, you, you use Linux. Um, try to get farmland if you can. Uh, you know, I still haven't bought a proper. I don't have my own plot of land yet, but I know someone who does. I know people who do. Who, who said you can come with me? You know, and so it's just like, I've I, I have places to go if I needed to. So um, it's not like I'm that worried and. I, I just don't, I don't, I don't worry as much as I do anymore. That's kind of where I lean more on my faith or on, 
Jesus rock. I'm not, I'm not afraid to die. You know, if it comes to it, I guess I'll, you know, whatever. Yeah. You know, um, uh, and so I'm less afraid and trying to live my day, day to day, looking at the sound and the birds and enjoying a nice, enjoying the little things that make you happy, like a good coffee and some donuts or something, you know, and not stressing. And again, balancing, working towards having a plot of land, um, doing the work you need to do to live your life, getting some free time and yeah, not like going to, you know, too much free time is no good, too lazy, too much freaking out about the bunker is also not that good. And so, you know, so how often do you and your wife talk about the bunker? Yeah, she doesn't really, it's like, she gets all this stuff, but she doesn't really care so much. Um, well, you know, she's doing the homeschooling stuff. She's studying homeopathy, right? Natural nice. alternative health, studying homeopathy. Um, uh, even informally, you know, she's not getting paid for it. The p people are like asking her, they're, oh, my kid's sick. What do I do? And so she's doing that. Uh, so, you know, she's got a full plate. So, yeah, and she's more tied to the urban social. And I'm more like the dude. I can go. I lived in the Gobi in the yurt. Like I can live in a village in the middle of nowhere like that. But, she, and yeah, I get it, you know, you get the kids, you get the network, social network. And so whatever. Well, it sounds like a lot of your balance just comes from uh, that interaction right there between you and your wife, you know, each yeah, one of you providing what the other lacks, which of course is the way I think marriage is supposed to work, but you know, I could be crazy. I've been called that before. As James Hetfield would say, energy derives from both the plus and negative. There you go. <laughs> one of the songs, I think it's from Justice for All, one of the songs I can't remember. I think you might be right. No, I'm, uh, I'm serious. We'll have to have somebody it's, it's fact actual, check it. Yeah. Uh, I'll, 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 no, it is. I think it's Justice for All. Uh, Metallica, energy derives. Let's see what comes up. Oh, wow. He's actually uh, doing it live. I have the, I have the beholder. I have the beholder lyrics. I, okay. There you go. <laughs> nice. Track. Is that the third track? No, uh, maybe. Anyways. Uh, oh, it's been forever where, since where I listened we? to that one. Well, I was, yeah. I was actually about to let you get back to uh, your lovely family because we've now been going for well over an hour. And I want to make sure that uh, we respect your time because I know you are a very busy man. Uh, so... As uh, as the parting, uh, what do you call it? Statement, I guess. Uh, let folks know where they can connect with you and your work. Geopoliticsandempire.com, uh, teensyradio.live. And I think, as you know, I'm most active on the X, Twitter X and Telegram. Um, because that's where most people are active. You know, I have the mm -hmm. MeWe and Minds, but those, I mean, I still post there occasionally, but they're dead and they just come to the point where it's not worth it anymore. Gab, like 1,100 followers, but yeah, so you just kind of go where the party's at, right? So, yeah. I mean, what yeah. else you, what else can you do at this point? Yeah. Like they, they've narrowed our, uh, uh, our choices down to, to literally just like a handful. Is either you do Facebook or you do Twitter, or you do TikTok. That's about it. Coke or Pepsi or Dr. Pepper, and that's yeah. it. <laughs> Maybe some RC Cola every now and then. Uh, anyone under twenty probably doesn't get that joke. Well, Hervoye, uh, it has been a pleasure speaking with you this evening, as always. Especially uh, not getting interrupted every ten minutes for a commercial break. <laughs> Yeah, that's the cool thing. Yeah, happy to join you anytime. Uh, love what you're doing, and I like getting a little um, esoteric. And people have told this to me, and I, I've been thinking about this as well recently, that when there are podcasts or interviews or whatever, live streams, that the host is... It's also important that the host asks good questions. And so oh, I've, yeah. I've, 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 I've sensed recently, I felt like where I've been a guest, like I think this was a great chat. I think the one this morning I did with Jason Levine was a good chat. Um, I can't recall now, but I think I've had in the past as a guest, I felt like it wasn't a great interview because I felt like it wasn't my 
it wasn't my fault. I think it's because the host wasn't hosting well. And so I felt yeah. like they didn't ask good questions. And so, but I thought um, that's also important, no? No, I agree. Absolutely. Matter of fact, this might be the first interview that I've done where I still have questions on my card that I haven't gotten to. So we'll just save those for round two. Round two. Tell me, you know, anytime, let, let's do it. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you again, Hervoye. And uh, I will now release you back to your regularly scheduled life so that you can uh, tuck the kids in, kiss the wife, and, and do all of that good stuff. Eat dinner and have, have a shot of mezcal. So. There you go. Sounds like a All plan. right. All right. Thanks. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us. See ya. Uh, all right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are now about to release you back to your regularly scheduled lives as well. We will be back on the air two nights from now, and that'll be March the 6th at 9 p.m. Eastern for your new music potluck and a third hour replay of The Hour of the Time with Bill Cooper. I haven't decided which episode of the hour of the time we're going to consume this week but i did put it out to the community in telegram a few weeks ago about going through the entire mystery babylon series and i think we will start doing that on the wednesday following the eclipse live stream so you definitely want to mark that down on your calendars and uh yeah, we'll put the replay up in the morning. And until we are back on the air two days from now, take care of yourselves, take care of each other. And uh, don't forget to take the trash out this week.